All right. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the class. If you're new, uh, extend a special welcome to you. Hope that you uh, enjoy what you have, what we have to offer here. And I'm going to highly encourage you all to ask questions uh, because this is not really a class where I'm teaching anything. This is a discussion or a, a work group where we all get together and share insights and information and experience and as we develop this program and go through it. So don't be shy about asking questions. Now, I have muted everybody's microphone. So if you want to, uh, to speak, all you have to do is hold down your space bar on your keyboard and that'll activate your mic and you can talk and then just let go of the space bar and that'll turn your mic back off. It'll keep all the back channels quiet so we don't get a lot of noise. Uh, but we do want your, your questions, okay? So don't be shy, is what I'm saying. All right, and so tonight's class, we're gonna continue with the display table. Let me just, maybe I can bring up, I'll share my screen real quickly. This is the display table that we have been programming. And we've worked on the legs and we've worked on uh, um, the tenons on the joinery for the rails here. And tonight we're going to continue on these rails, but we're going to show you how to design to cut this arc in the rail, which we're going to do in Aspire or VCAR Pro. And then we're going to import that into our CCAM profile so that it collects all of our programs and all of our parts into one project, okay? So before we do that real quickly, I wanna show you, we've been asked if I uh, export or import this project, um, you know, is there gonna be a problem or is it gonna work? So let's go into projects here real quickly. It's my display table, I'm gonna select it. And if we look under the turning center, there's the leg. And of course that has the multi-sided, let me go ahead and get rid of that real quickly. It has the multi-sided, um, has the mortising, has the uh, turn around with the taper, the profiles, and also has the, uh, what we would call the uh, lamb's tongue on it. So all of the leg has been programmed and tested. That's when we had our little, exciting little event with the four jaw chuck and the wrong offset. We'll go over more of that later. <laughs> we also went into the display table rails under the vertical table. And this is where we created the tenons for the joinery. So tonight what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the horizontal table and we created the all of the blanks in these different workstations. And we have here the rails. And so for the rails, we'll create, or we'll actually import a toolpath so that we'll have everything in this one project. So the question came up is if you take, and if I export this project, for example, um, maybe I'll just throw it onto my desktop real quickly. And it's called the Des display table export. All right. And I'm gonna close, uh, I'm gonna close uh, CCAM Pro altogether and reopen it. And this time I'm gonna say file, import the project. So I'll put this online, you can download it. It would actually be in your downloads, but mine's on my desktop. And so there it is right there, it was created today. Let's go ahead and open it. Your project has been displayed as display table one, because I already had a display table in here under projects. So it's just saved it with a one underneath of it. Now I'm gonna select this, open it up, just make sure we have everything and see if we, if we lost anything. Sure enough, we lost, lost all of our parts. Okay, so this is uh, uh, what a couple of people have told me. They're, they're blank, they don't have anything. So uh, this is a bug, obviously. I'm gonna have to get to, with uh, one of our programmers and we'll get this resolved. Find out why it didn't come in. All righty, yeah, unfortunately, sorry about that, but we'll get it figured out for you. Okay, so I'm gonna go I'm back. I'm glad it worked for you. <laughs> yeah, really. All right, so I'm going to go into display table, and I apologize. I mean, this is a uh, this is a beta version, and we're all testing this at the at the same time. And I'm testing it live, so I will make mistakes. I promise you that, and we'll find the things that are not working correctly. So here, I opened up the one that I originally created, and sure enough, everything's there. Now, all right. So if we look at our drawing here 
it's got this arc right here in the bottom of it, or in the part you can see it right here. And I currently have a, don't have a way to program that within CCAM Pro, so we're going to do it in Aspire. Now, uh, what I'll do, it could be VCard Pro as well, but I'm going to open up a separate instance of Aspire right here, for example. And I'll say create a new file. And if I'm not sure what size it is, then I'll just go ahead and, and put something in here. So I actually, I actually know what it is. It's 8.7 by 4. So we'll go ahead and put it in here. We can always change this later if we need to. And it's 3 quarters of an inch thick. And we're going to use our offset in the bottom left-hand corner. And we're going to set our Z0 position on the machine bed. Again, this is my default go-to method and yours might be the top and it's it's okay. You just need to know so when you set up your part, you set it up correctly. We're gonna have Z0 on the bottom. And I'm gonna click okay. Now I'm gonna go back to the other drawing that I have here. And hey, Tracy, I, I, um, yes. when you set it up on the machine bed and you say the part is three quarters of an inch thick, it has uh -huh. to be three quarters of an inch thick, right? What if it's 0.77 inches thick? Okay, here's what'll, well, that's a great question. Okay, so what'll happen if it is um, 0.77 inches thick and you set it for the bottom, then it might start a little lower in the material, but it will cut only all the way through the material to the bed. And this is why I set the Z0 on the bottom. If I had set the Z0 on the top and I said it's cut through three quarters, but the part was 0.77, uh, it, it would leave 20 thousandths of material uh, as a, what they call an onion skin. It wouldn't cut all the way through the blank. So my preference is to set the Z0 on the bottom, and then I know it'll cut all the way through regardless of the thickness. If the part is not thick enough, it'll still end at the bottom. If it's too thick, it'll still end at the bottom. Okay, now this doesn't always work. Um, and so in some cases where, let's say that on this part right here, we were gonna do some inlay on this face right here. Well, in that case, I would probably set Z0 on the top because the depth of that inlay from that surface of the material is very critical. So in that case, I would probably set it at the top. Either that, or I would set it at the bottom and I would write a program to thickness plane the part so that it was exactly 0.75 and then my inlay would be perfect and I'd still have Z0 set on the bottom. So, you know, there's, it's a personal choice, but by setting it on the bottom, you know you're not gonna cut, you, you're gonna cut deep enough so you don't leave an onion skin and you're not gonna cut so deep into your spoil board that you, you know, that you cut great big gigantic grooves. It controls the bottom of the cut is, is why I do that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. All right. I think you just answered my comment, Tracy. Uh, okay. When you say it's on the bed, it's actually on the top of your spoil board. Is that correct? That is correct. It's the top of the spoil board. That's perfect. Um, and if you, if you look back in here, well, let me go back to the other one I just opened. So if I go into the material setup, uh, you can see it, it's called material surface, which would be the top, or machine bed. And the machine bed is the the table, you might have a, a T-track table, or you might have a spoil board, you might, it's whatever the material is sitting on. So it's the bottom of the material or the top of the material is really what you're looking at. Okay, so let's let's open up this one again. And I'm just gonna to grab this, it's already drawn in here, it's all ready to go. So I'm just gonna highlight that and I'll just use control C to copy, or I can say edit and uh, copy right here, or yeah, control C to copy that, right? Now, when I go into this other one and I say control V or paste, then it doesn't look like it pasted anywhere, but if we zoom out, you can see it's, it's it just put it back in its original position. So now what I wanna do is place that in my blank. So I'm just gonna use my align objects icon over here on the left, and I'll click on that, and Sure enough, it puts it right back into the part, like so. Now, this shows the overall size, and then it shows the tenons that are cut here. And we've cut those in previous classes. 
unfortunately, I don't have one of those samples where we cut the tenons. And so I just made up some new blanks that are the 8.7 by four, the size of this right here. All we're gonna do in this class is just cut this arc because it's done on the horizontal table, not on the vertical table. So I'm gonna select this arc. And the problem is you can see it's actually one closed vector that goes all the way around. And, and I don't want that. I just want an open vector that is the arc itself. So I can go into what's called node editing mode and you can either click on this node editing button under edit objects over here, or you can press the letter N as a keyboard shortcut and that'll put you in node editing and I'll zoom out a little bit. So now I can see all the nodes in all the corners. So what I'll do is I'll go to this first one right here and I'm gonna right click on it and I'm gonna say, cut this vector, or I could just press the letter C, okay? And I can do the same thing here. Again, right, right click it right here and say cut, or again, just press the letter C. And, and then I'm gonna go out of node editing by using the letter N on my keyboard, okay? And now you can see that this is separate from the rest of the, of the vector or the blank. Okay, so now we have just a vector that we wanna create a tool path for that we can cut on the horizontal table. Now you also have a couple of options here. We can either climb mill or conventional uh, mill or what they usually refer to as undercutting this arc. And my preferred way is to climb mill because you get less tear out on these corners of these edges. If we undercut, it, especially as you're coming out here, you might blow out that corner right there. So there are many options and, and systems for eliminating tear out. Um, one is you drill right here using the same cutter so that it eliminates that end grain. Another one is that you tape that edge with some painter tape. Um, but climb milling is probably the simplest way to do it. And so that's what we're gonna do. Now the router bit, if I was to draw it in here real quickly, I'm, I'm not gonna draw it to scale or anything, but that, that's like looking at the cutter right there. And so if it starts right here and it's cutting this direction, it's gonna be undercutting or conventional milling. Whereas if it starts on this side and cuts this direction, it's gonna be climb milling because the part is turning clockwise as we go along. So it's gonna climb into the material, less likely to tear out the grain. So I want it to start here and cut on the left side of this line. That's what I want it to do. Okay, I'm just gonna delete that right there. So if I go into node editing again by pressing the letter N, you can see the green part here is the starting point and the arrow points this direction. So it's gonna cut this way. In other words, it's going to be undercutting. So I wanna change this, I'm gonna right click on this node and I'm gonna say, make this the start point or press the letter P, right? So now you can see the arrow is going this direction, the green dot where it starts is over here. So all I have to do is make sure that I'm cutting on the left side of the dot or of the line. And it's as if you were standing on this dot looking away from you this way, are you cutting on the left-hand side or the right-hand side? Okay, so this is gonna be left, I'll press the letter N to get out of node editing. So I just got that selected. And now I'm gonna switch over to my um, tool pass. And with that selected and our starting point over on this right-hand side, I'm gonna use the profile tool path, right? And our cut depth is going to be Z and that would cut just straight down to the spoil board. At this point, if you wanted to add you know, 10 thousandths to make sure you cut down into the spoil board a little bit. I especially do this with like things like melamine or plywood where I don't wanna leave an onion skin because I'll tear up that skin. I wanna make sure I cut all the way through. So I'm gonna say plus, and then I'll put 0 0.015 and press the equal key. And so it's gonna cut 0.765. Now you could do the math in your head obviously, but you can use that as a calculator with a variable. It makes it really easy to do. All right, so there we go. That ensures, because we have, we have anchored the Z0 on the bottom plane, that ensures that it won't cut any deeper than 15 thousandths of an inch into the spoil board, right? Okay. Now Crazy. we're gonna, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, for the beginners, you wanna go over the uh, check in your settings before you get into this? Uh, checking settings, uh, which settings are you referring to? Well, when you go to the tool side, 
you're you always want to go up to the set to check to make sure everything's set right before you go into tooling J just for the beginners that don't know what the real uh, process is oh i see what you're saying okay so are you referring to the set here in the material setup yes okay yeah this is a good practice and i apologize this I did brand this as an intermittent class, intermediate. So if you're brand new, I apologize. We might be stepping over your head, but uh, have no problem uh, answering questions. So if you got a question or a suggestion, please jump in here. So after I created this vector and stuff, before I go in and create my tool path, it is a good practice to click into start or into set rather. And this will, this will show you a couple of things. The material thickness that you programmed was 0.75. The XY datum position was in this bottom corner, and the Z0 is on the machine bed. We could change this all right here, even after we've created the part, and it's okay. Now, the other things that you have in here are the model position. In this case, it's irrelevant because we're not dealing with any modeling. We're only dealing with 2D tool paths. If it was a model, you could either push the model up or down, and generally we'd push it to the top. But again, in this case, it's irrelevant because there is no model. It's just a tool path that's following a vector. It's a 2D cut. All right. But down here, you have rapid Zs, and these can be important and confusing. All right. So you have two uh, rapid Z gaps above the material, um, and it will rapid Z down to one position, and then it'll rapid Z again down to another position, and then it'll go in and start cutting with a feed rate. Right. These are really nice to use to jump over clamps or toe clamps or, you know, things like that that are in the way. But if you ever, you know, it generally, if you have them both set to 0.2 inches, it'll skip the second one. It'll rapid Z down to 0.2 inches above the material, and then it'll plunge in with a feed rate and start making its cut. All right. So some people will set this to uh, uh, 0.1. So it's just uh, the Z2, which is real close to the material. Right. And then up the set the uh, one up here to something higher, maybe maybe even like one inch, okay, or a point two. In this case, we don't really have to worry about it too much, but you can control where it's going to plunge into and where it's going to lift out of with this right here. You can also control that when the part finishes or when it's or it starts, you can set a Z gap above the material. So if I said one inch right there then it would start at one inch before it goes down to the Z1, then the Z2, and then into the part. And when it finished, it would lift out to this one inch, the gap above the material. So that's the very beginning and the very end. You could also use this right here, this X axis position to actually push it back out of the way. So if I said 12 inches, it would push, once it's finished the cut, it would move the gantry back 12 inches to clear the part. Or And you could set it to a bigger number than 12, but you can set it whatever you want. And the Y, you could you know, push that over as well. So I might push it to 12 and 12, for example. So let's go ahead and save that. Tra hey, Tracy. Yes. Um, can I ask a quick question on that? And maybe this is for a different class, but that whole position of the model, uh -huh. I, don't, I don't quite understand that because you have the gap above, the gap below, yeah, okay. Let me let me demonstrate it by throwing a model on here real quickly for you, okay? And, and I don't mind, you know, if it's something simple, we'll, we're going to jump in and actually demonstrate it. If it's too advanced for, or, in, in, you know, too, too much material <laughs> for this, we'll create a different class for it. But I'll show you here. If I simply go into clip art, and I go to clip art here, I might have to, to uh, it's possible, I might have to... Uh, log on the part let's go to orders animals tabs plants okay i'm not logged in i'll say you your content will refresh automatically in the background log out okay it's no problem. I don't want to take you away from what you're doing. I was just curious about it. Well, I, I, I will show you. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to understand once you see it. Okay, 
Um, again, this is the brand new version and I'm not seeing the clip art in here. So I'm gonna do it the old fashioned way for you real quickly. I'm gonna go back into drawing. I'm simply gonna draw a circle here and then I'm going to the modeling tab. So this is would be an advanced class on modeling, but I'll just show you real quickly. We can turn that circle into a model, which I'll do real quickly. And I'm gonna say limit the height to 0.25. Okay, so this model is gonna be 0.25 and we're gonna dish and I'm gonna apply that and we'll, uh, oops, it didn't apply it. All right, let's go do it again. All right, so, okay, here we go. So if we look at the 3D view, you see this one's dished up. We wanna dish it down in, make it a cup. And we've set it for a quarter inch. So I'm gonna close that. Now, if we go back to our 2D view, it kind of shows you a shaded representation, a grayscale, the darker the gray, the deeper the cut, okay? So this is what I'm gonna show you. Now we're gonna go back into the material setup. All right, and you can see here, in fact, that's not very deep. I'm gonna go in and make that a little deeper. Okay. Okay, the shape height is only 4,000. Again, I'm gonna make it 0.25 and we'll close that. So I'll make the, the dish a little bit deeper. Now, when we go into set over here, here, here's what you can see now. There is a gap above, and in this case, it's a half inch. And then a gap below is zero and you got the slider, you can see the darker material is the actual material, the lighter material is the model. So you can see now I'm pushing the model as I drag this up to the top. So this would carve the model in the top here, whereas if I cut it down here, it would carve the model down at the bottom. Let me, let me just demonstrate that for you real quickly. We'll go ahead and, and uh, create a, a ball nose eighth inch. Okay, we're just gonna calculate a tool path and we're gonna preview it. And you can see how deep it cut that model because it pushed it all the way down to the bottom. And let me see if I can get this turn so you can see it. All right, so that's cleared out at the bottom, which we didn't want. So I'm gonna go back into set. This is where you would wanna push the model to the top. And you can see the model's now up here and there's material underneath of it. This is gonna recalculate everything and it's recalculated successfully. So we'll go back in and preview it again. I'm gonna reset my preview. And now you can see that it's cutting in the top, okay? That's what the model is. If you create a model, import or create a model, then you have to set it where you want it to cut in the material, in most cases in the top, all right? But because in our particular project, we don't have a model, we're simply cutting a vector. Again, it's irrelevant. Okay, so you won't see it. So if I come over here and I simply delete this model so that there is no T2D model at all now and we go to reset our preview, I, I don't have a model to, to, to see. If I go back into set, again, you can see that there is no model there. So it's just a line, the thickness of the vector. So again, irrelevant if you don't have a model. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. Okay, great. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and use these numbers, the 12, 12, the one inch. The, we don't care about the position of the model because there is not one and we'll go ahead and click okay. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back into here and select this. And stepping back, I pressing the node, I, I created the starting point on this side, right? And that's what we want. So now we'll create our, I'm gonna delete this 3D finish, that's the carving. We'll get rid of that all together. We're gonna to create a vector that's just a tool path, a profile tool path. And this is where we're going to, to cut it. Again, the, the depth, which we know is 0.75. I, I might get, make it 0.76, so it's 10 thousandths of an inch deeper. So you can either use the calculator or not. I need to restart my computer or my camera real quick. Hold on a sec.
I've got new cameras on order that are for streaming and they will not do this to me, but right now we have to deal with what I've got. All right, so, all right, back to the thing. So our depth is just barely through the material by 10 thousandths. And we're gonna select a cutter and we're gonna use a, uh, a down cut spiral and we'll use a quarter inch diameter, three quarters of an inch long, okay? And we can give it a, a, a feed rate. We can either do it here, or I can simply select that and then click on edit right here and change the feed rate on here. If I do it from the edit, it won't change the default values in the tool database. If I change it in there, it will update those. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell it we're gonna cut 150 inches a minute. And our plunge, I'm going to set it 40. That's fine. And we're going to use it as tool number two. Okay. Let's say this has two flutes. It tells us our, our chip load is about four thousandths. And we can make it a little bit bigger than that if we move this down to like 16,000 RPM. So that's about a five thousandths uh, chip load. So we'll, we'll go ahead and use it like that. And this is not a class on feeds and speeds. We've already done that, but I'm just showing you where you adjust them. Okay, then we have the edit the passes. And I'm going to make this in just two passes. And uh, that'll be fine. And then what I do want to do, instead of cutting right on the line, we have to cut on the left side of the line. So I'm going to choose this inside slash left. Inside would be a closed vector. Left would be an open vector. And this is an open vector we're gonna cut on the left-hand side. So that's the one we wanna choose. And then I'm gonna tell it to do a, a separate last pass and I'm gonna make it 15 thousandths of an inch. So 0 0.015 inches. And if you want to, you could reverse the direction but I'm not going to, I'm gonna leave it the same. All right, and we'll do it in two passes. Because we're, we're starting here off the edge of the material, I don't care about ramping. So I'm, I'm not gonna to bother to ramp. And we'll just call this the uh, uh, display table uh, arc or arch. Maybe I like arch better than arc. Okay. We'll calculate that. It tells me we're going to cut all the way through. And you can see now that there are two blue lines. So that means there's two passes. Red lines are rapid positioning and greens are plunges. So you can kind of see what's going to happen here. And we can preview it. And sure enough, it'll cut that out just like so. All right, so once we have our part programmed, we're gonna select, and, and we've only got one tool path here, but if we wanted to cut a you know, round over this edge, or we wanted to cut a, kind of a, a V cut around here to create a border, or we wanted to do some you know, chip carving in here or inlay or something, or 3D carving, whatever we wanna do on here, we could, we could create all of these tool paths to do so and then we'd save it. So I'm gonna highlight just that one. I'm gonna save it, make sure it's visible tool pass or all to one file. Make sure that it's the Delta three axis post processor, which I have here. And then we'll save this tool path. And I'm just gonna save it again onto my desktop and that's where we'll load it from. And it's, so it's called display table arch and it'll be a .nc. So that's the file we created. And we'll see you. Are you really starting outside of the cut or are you starting on the cut? You said you're coming in from the outside if you're... Yeah, let me, let, oh, let me show you how you can tell what you've done, all right? If you go back to the 2D view right here, you can see that the... I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit here. You can see that the dotted line is the actual vector that we're going to cut. This line okay. out here with the arrows is showing the cut. Now, you can also come up here and click on this little icon. You can either show an arrow or you can show um, the actual, and I turned it off. I see it, thanks. Yeah, I turned it off. What did I do? <laughs> click the checkbox. Yeah, display your tool path. There we, <laughs> there we go, that's what I'm looking for, okay? So this is actually the quarter inch cutter and you can see that it's cutting on this side of the line. So depending upon uh, the icon that you choose up here, toggle between, and we don't want to toggle there. Up here, we're toggling between 
actually the, the, cat, the path with the cut and just the path with the arrows. So this one shows you right to left. It's on the left-hand side of the line though, but it's cutting right to left on the left-hand side of the line. And so it's cutting the arc the way we want it to. And again, I, I do like this view because it, it tells me exactly what's going on. You know, I can see if I'm cutting to the line. And if I, if I set an allowance offset, you would actually be able to see that allowance offset um, here as well. So if I move the allowance offset, it push it above the line or below the line, depending on which direction you go. So real handy view here. All right, so we have saved that. Uh, Tracy, now. In, your tool, in your tool path, you actually had a checkbox for conventional or climb. Why are those checkboxes there? Check marks here? No, in your actual tool path, open that up. Okay, so let's go into my tool path. <clears throat> Yeah, you okay. got climb and conventional right there. Right. Let's change this to conventional and see what it does. All right, so um, it's calculated it. I'm going to come back to here and I'm going to change back to this view. All right, so this is now cutting left to right and that is conventional cutting. So that's a, that was actually very excellent. You could simply come in here and say whether you want to climb or conventional and it'll decide which way you're going. Um, I always like to check the vector and the starting point and I determine exactly what I'm doing uh, instead of letting the software calculate it, but obviously the software is calculating correctly. So that's a good point. That was Bob that suggested that, is that right? Yeah, I just was curious as to why you had that since you already set the starting point in the beginning. Yeah, so um, again, you can just say, um, you know, here you still have conventional climb, you're still gonna have whether it's cutting on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the arc. And so if I had the starting point over here, I would have said it's cutting on the right-hand side, I would have chosen this other one if I had left the starting point there. And then I could have said, well, climb mill, but this is the starting point, it would have done it the other way, okay? So it is important to know where your starting point is. And then if you're gonna cut on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of that line, and I did this, both of them at the same time. I said, okay, start here. So I'm cutting on the left-hand side and I know it'd be climbing, okay. Yeah, I, I do it like you do. I set where the uh, green dot is and then don't worry about what it says in the, in the form. Yeah, but obviously you can double check it just by coming in here and looking at the arrows and it's working correctly, so. Uh, you know, I'm probably overthinking the whole thing. So, so Tracy, you set the start yeah. point to the right side, left it on uh, climb mill. But if you click that button for conventional, then it switched it over the other direction. When it's done cutting the tool path, will it go back to the original start point of the vector that you set? Or would well, it, let's, you know? let's see. Okay, so I had gone into here and went into some node editing, and I had set it to this point here, right? Because it, it was here originally, and I wanted it to be over here, so I changed it to here. Now, if we go back in here, let's just let's just check this out. Let's come back in here, and let's say conventional. So we're going to leave everything exactly that it was. We're just going to change to conventional. We're not going to change the start change the starting point. We're going to calculate that, and we'll go back to the two D view. And sure enough, it starts over here, even though I determined this was the starting point. So that determined the starting point for the fact that you're cutting on the left-hand side. But because we're gonna conventional mill, move it back here. Now, if I uncheck this, right? And I go back into node editing. Oh, I gotta get out of here. If I go back into node editing. You can see it left it where I created it. So this is still the starting point for the left to right, but it programmed it to start opposite so that it would conventional. Right, uh, right. But my, my question is, once it's done cutting the part, it goes back to the machine, takes the part or the uh, spindle back to the starting position of the cut, correct? So would it oh, do no, that? It'll, it'll take it all the way back to, when it's finished, it would normally go to X0, Y0. But you notice in here, when I, in the set, I told it to go to X12, Y12, and a gap above one inch. So it, where it's gonna end up, when it's all done cutting this, it's gonna move out here 
uh, somewhere out of the way, 12 inches in both directions. It's going to, it's going to end up clear up here out of the way. And that's okay. because I put these values in here. If I had left this to zero, then it would, it would go back to the zero point of the part. Okay. The, the X, Y datum position. Okay. So, that, that's what I was trying to get at. Thank you. Okay. So oh. that, but, that button says home slash start position. Does that mean when you start the process, it's also going to go to that X12, Y12? Correct. Before it's, it moves? Yes, it's where it starts and where it stops. So if I go into my um, desktop real quickly and we look for the arch right here, and you can see right here, the very first thing it does after the tool changes, it goes to X12, Y12. Okay. Then it um, turns on the spindle at that point, and then it moves back over to its starting point and it makes its cut. And when it's all done, it goes back, it, is, it lifts up to 1.75. So it's an inch above the material, and then it moves back to X12, Y12. So it does it at the beginning, the home, and also at the end. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. All right. All right, Percy, do you think you'd ever have a problem by not using tabs and that waste piece getting hung up with the spindle itself? Well, okay, here's the deal. Because I don't have a closed vector here, right? This is an open vector. And I'm actually going to cut, if we go back and look at this uh, uh, cut right here, you can see that the cut is going to go clear outside. Of the, it's going to start right here, and it's going to cut all the way out. And same thing, it's going to end out of the material. I don't have to worry about this part getting caught up in the bit, especially since I'm using a small diameter cutter, only half inch. Now, if this was in a, in a hole, inside a hole, then you got to worry about that part breaking loose and starting to catch the bit and then jump into the bit and bend the bit and cause all kinds of damage. So, so in this case, the only reason that I would want tabs is if I want this part to be held in position. If this was a critical part that I want to keep, but in reality, I don't care about this part. So as I cut this through, that's just going to fall away. Okay, N not an issue. Okay, thank you. Now, um, it also depends on how you're going to secure this part. Whether you want to secure, it, whether you want tabs here or whatever. If I'm clamping, you know, out here, and this is going to fall away, I don't care. I'm just going to use double-sided tape in here. So again, irrelevant. If I put a piece of double-sided tape right here in the middle, that would hold it. I wouldn't need a tab as well. Okay, so lots of options, but generally when it's open, especially if it's a small diameter cutter, like quarter inch, it's not an issue. It's when you're cutting inside a circle or inside a closed vector and that part is small enough that it'll break loose and then jump into the cutter, the cutter drags it in. That's, that's serious problems. Okay, so hey, now, Tracy. yeah. One question, I believe it's irrelevant whether you start on the left side or the right side because the bit is turning clockwise. So if you start on the right side, you still have a chance of tearing out the right side. If you start it on the left side, just the same way because it's, it's the direction of the turning of the bit on that edge on this particular piece. Am I right or wrong on that? Um, well, let me show you the difference, and we're taking a chance, <laughs> okay, but most likely we're going to be fine, and this is why. Right here at this end, it's going to plunge down. I, again, I didn't ramp. I just said plunge and then cut, and the reason I did that is because we're mostly off the part. The router bit's sitting right here, as you can see, so it's tangent to that starting point, and so when, it, when it's plunging down, it's less likely to tear than it is if you just cut into it, okay? So that's, that's, that because, that's because technically you're actually plunging into it as you're going in, because you, did, you didn't start off the piece, you started on the piece. Yeah, we're starting, the rounder bit is mostly off the piece. It, there's a little bit on, and we're gonna plunge down in there. So the odds are we most likely will not chip this out, okay? And this is one of the techniques that I'll use to eliminate a tear out there is that I'll actually drill, I'll use that same cutter and just drill a hole right there because cutting straight down is only cutting a little tiny bit of material at a time, not the whole face of the edge of the part, just a little bit as it plunges. And so it's less likely to tear. 
Now, when we come to this side, because we're clockwise, as we come out, again, less likely to tear here, okay? Because we're climbing into that edge. Now, if we did reverse it, we would be climbing in here, no tear out. But when we get off to this other side, let me uh, zoom out back in. When we get out to this side, that is tearing out right there. And very likely, we're going to chip this out. So in this case, it's better to start here because we're plunging straight down off the edge and then coming out on the other side, climb milling. So that that's definitely why you don't want to create a ramp going in there, because if you created a ramp, you would also tear out this side. Yeah, I would because a ramp will go down and then it'll come back on that um, to cut that out. And that would be undercutting here as it came out through here to finish that ramp and uh, probably tear out the part. So this is one case where I don't ramp. If you are having a lot of problems with that, is there such a thing as coming one direction halfway up and going on a second tool path the other direction? Um, yeah, it's possible. Now, I, I've never experimented with that, but it's theoretically, Alvin, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, just keep in mind that if you're cutting one direction, you might be undercutting. If you're cutting left to right, you'll be undercutting which will tend to pull the cutter into the part and pull the fibers of the wood into the bit, where when you're cutting right to left on the other half, you're climb milling, which is pushing it away. And so you're going to have a little bit of a mark in the center where they meet. Okay, so it's better to cut the same all in one direction to eliminate any, um, any, any marks because of the two different directions and the torque on the bit. I have some experience with that. I did a Chevron door uh, uh -huh. for a client, and we did it at an MDF the first time, which it didn't matter. Then he wanted some done out of maple. And uh -huh. the only way I could prevent tear out was if I started, I had all individual tool paths, and I went in with the V cutter from the outside in to the piece. And I didn't get any tear out at the center of the Chevrons or anything like that. If I tried to just run it and let the, let the software determine the direction, I would get uh -huh. tear out and chipping out of the maple in the center. Um, I could show it next time where I bring up a picture of it. But the only way I could get a good cut on the maple was to come in from the outside perimeter into the piece. And it was a bunch of single tool paths that went to the center of the piece and it came out perfect. So it just really right. depends on the wood. Um, yeah, absolutely. I had three doors that way, and I probably spent three hours playing around with it, and about forty-five minutes to cut them. So. Yeah, L let me let me draw something up here for you real quickly. And fortunately, this is a short class because we're taking <laughs> a lot of time. Okay, so let's say that I just drew a circle right there. It's not perfect, but it's it's close enough. I'm going to use that circle to do a drill, a drilling tool path, and we'll go down the uh, just the Z, the the full depth. We won't worry about any farther than that. And I'm going to use the same cutter, the end mill quarter inch right here. Okay. Now on in this one also, I'm going to go in and edit it, and I'm going to slow my plunge rate down. I'm going to go down to 30. Okay. And we won't use a peck drilling method. We're just going to drill straight down through the material because, again, we're off the material quite a bit. Only this front edge is, is actually on the material. Okay, now I'm going to reset my preview, and I'm going to show you this. We'll preview this guy right here. And um, if I slow this way down, uh, slow way down maybe like this, let's preview it, and you'll see, uh, okay, it didn't. It, it didn't do much to slow it down, but what it did, unfortunately, I can't pan this very well. It started right here and it, it slowly plunges down right here. And because it's, it's plunging real slowly, it's, you know, it's not coming in all of this space at one time attacking the whole thing. It's just the very bottom edge of that a little at a time. You're very unlikely to tear out that edge. So this is a technique that I will use if tear out is an issue. I'll drill that first and then I'll go ahead and cut it. Uh, Ollie, you had a question? 
No, I say if you grew up on top, up top, if you want to see it with fishes. I'm sorry, you broke up just a little bit. Say that again. I said, if you went up top and clicked on the little Z. Um, are you talking about uh, here on my screen? Um, Further, I'll keep going up. Okay, up here in this, in these toolbars? No, no, to the right. He's talking okay. about the shortcuts in the top right corner of the picture. I mean Move your uh, your display. Oh, yeah. Move my display. Okay, so yeah, we can do something like this. All right, and then you can see as it comes down here, it's plunging real slowly, so it's just cutting on that very bottom edge a little at a time till it gets through. And so I've removed most of that green. So now when I come back here and cut this art, a lot less likely to do that. The other thing I've done is I have put um, painting painters tape on here and. Uh, so I overlap this edge and, and protect this, and then I cut through that, and the painter's tape keeps the, the edges from breaking out as well. Okay. Tracy, is this also a case where you could use a counterclockwise bit? Um, no, you'd have the same issues with a counterclockwise bit. You, you, one side's gonna be climbing, one side's gonna be undercutting, because you're going in one side and out the other. Uh, it's always going to be an issue. It's just, yeah, you know, the best way for you to deal with it. Okay. All right. So now we've got our tool path done. I'm going to, I didn't save this drill as part of the tool path. If we went back here and just open this arc again, you can see it's pretty straightforward. All it does is it, it goes to the 12, 12 turns on and then, and then it makes the cut. And there's a G3 right there and a G3 right there. So it has two passes to cut this arc. Very simple code, right? So now let's go ahead and jump back into CCAM Pro. And we're going to go to the horizontal table. And we're going to pick on the, the rails. And we're going to say manage a toolpath. Right? And we're simply going to click on the import. And we're going to import a vectric G code text right here and hit select and then this field right here this is the the field so you will click on this to go select it and it's on my uh, desktop again so i'll go here and sure enough there it is the display table arc it's an nc file we'll open that up and just click finish and save now what it's going to do is going to say okay you brought in a bit i want to make sure that we're going to match the same bit within here and the bit that I chose is right here, select a tool that matches an end mill, quarter inch diameter, three quarter inch cutting length. And if it's not in the toolbox, you must add it. Well, this one is in the toolbox. So if I go to the end mill down cut, it happens to be right there. So I'll go ahead and select this cutter and just say select. Okay, so you're gonna match it. Now it says right here, okay, the, the default is one. And the last time it used one, do you wanna use a different tool number? And when I set up all these other cuts, when we did the turning round, for example, I used the surface planing bit as tool number one. I used that quarter inch end mill as bit number two. So I'm just gonna put it in right there and I'm gonna click on assign as the new tool number. And then I'll generate my G code. And sure enough, right there, there's M6T2. And turn the spindle on and there's going to the 1212 and then it's making the two cuts and it's ending back up here at 1212. Hey, just a quick question about that. Yeah. So in Mach 3, when you tell the thing to run your program, it typically goes to zero, zero, uh -huh. then starts to plunge down a little bit and starts the spindle and then moves to where it's ever it's going to cut. In this case, is it going to go to zero, zero, start the spindle, then move to 12, 12 and back? All right, that's a great question. So um, the M6, you have to know what M6 does completely. And in both Mach 3 and Delta, this is what it does now. Um, it puts away an existing tool, either manually or auto, and it picks up tool number two if it's not already in there. If it's already in there, it skips that part. 
It then looks to see if smart tool is on. If it is, it goes over and touches smart tool and sets the Z. Okay. At that point, it goes to X0, Y0. That's part of M6. It will go there. And so this one is going to go to, to X0, Y0 as in here and also in, in mock. And then it's going to turn the spindle on. And then it's going to move to this point. Now, up here, it's in safety. So it's up at the top. And then it's going to turn the spindle on. And then it's going to go to 12, 12. And then it's going to go to the new point and it's going to plunge down in and it's going to cut. And then it's going to go back to, um, oh, this one didn't go to 12, 12. Okay. Oh, interesting. All right. Let me show you the difference. Mike, you could probably caught me on this because I didn't catch it myself. All right. So when you um, go into this part, manage parts on the horizontal and we've got this rail we have a program end position right here now i actually like this better than um better than uh the way aspire handles it aspire has it as the start and the end position where in here we just say the end position because we don't really care where it starts it, it goes to zero zero and then it goes in and makes the cut that's great um but if we put in here, make it go to 12, 12, and select this. Now the question is, is it going to, is it going to, is it going to change that? Again, this is where we're learning together. We'll see what happens. Okay, and sure enough, I'm gonna use this same end mill and we'll use it as number two. We'll generate our G code. Okay, now look at this. It went to 1212. Okay, so what happened is, was, um, Conversational Cam Pro stripped out the end value because in Conversational Cam Pro, we said the ending position was zero, zero. So even though it came in with the 12, 12, it said, nope, it's going to end at zero, zero. So it stripped it out. Now I brought the other code in and it didn't care what happened at the beginning. So this 12, 12 is still there because that's what was in Aspire. But we put in the 12, 12 in C Cam Pro to make sure it ends here. Now, if you want to change this code, what we'll do is we'll go back into the part right here. And um, let's go ahead into our set. Let's change this back to zero, zero. I think it makes more sense to do it that way because then you're taking less time to. Yeah, to move it out and then back in. Around. Yeah, you're right. Uh, like I said, I like this this method much better. So this now, if I save just the, I don't want the drilling toolpath. We're just going to save just the display toolpath right here. And, oops, I didn't save it. Let's save the toolpath. Yeah, let's save just the the arch. And I'm going to overwrite the existing one. Okay. I think that's going to work. And then we're going to come back into here, into our display table rail. I'm going to manage tool pass. I'm just going to delete this one. I probably don't have to. I probably can just uh, open that and go into my desktop and select it. So I've selected the same one, but it's been changed. And then we'll see if this works. And I can use the same one. We set two again. Let's generate this G code. All right. So here's our tool change. Yeah, you notice this one because mock said start and end at zero zero. So that's what it brought in. But CCAM Pro said end at 1212. So this is a, in my opinion, a better way to handle it because it doesn't go to 1212 to start, which moves it out of the way and then back into the cut. All right. Okay, so, so that's why, why does why does it go to Z zero dot zero? At the very beginning? At the beginning and the end. 
Okay. Um, again, if we go into Aspire, when we, let me turn my camera back on, sorry about that. Isn't that your touch off point? All right. It's all controlled by this set, material setup, set button right here. It's all controlled by this right here. So anytime you generate code in Aspire VCard Pro, it's going to put this number in the code at the beginning, at the end. Now we said it was zero. So when we actually opened that code and looked at it, sure enough, it went to zero. But because in CCAM Pro, we said go to 1212 at the end, it overwrote the uh, code from uh, Aspire, the end, and put in our value of 12. Or our yeah, our values of X12, Y12. No, it says Z0. 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 Oh. Okay. And you're saying at the beginning at the end. It's in both places. All right. So here we go. Um, that is machine whenever... zero at the end. Yes, it's machine coordinates all the way to the top. There. Oh, right here? Is that what you're talking about? There and down at the bottom, right above the uh, M5, it says Z0.0. .0. Isn't that right. the same as your touch-off point? G53. Okay. So here's the difference. Um, and we put this into... I, I, I designed this into to, um, CCAM Pro and CCAM because I like to get the bit up the full distance. Now in Aspire, when you say, if you give it a gap above the material, go back into here real quickly, and we go to setup, let me get out of there. All, the only control you have is this gap above the material. And so you gotta make it high enough to give you enough clearance, but if you make it too high, you'll have a soft limit error, okay? So you're not sure how much gap you have if you put too much of a gap. So you have to keep it fairly low, right? So I didn't like that. So when I designed conversational cam, I said, anytime we go to start the program or end the program, we're going to raise the cutter completely out of the way. And we're going to go to the very top, what's called safe Z. Okay. So G53 is machine coordinates, not the work offset coordinates. So all these coordinates up here are work offsets. This one here and this one up here is G53. So it's saying go to Z0, which is up at the top where it homes. Does that make sense? Yes, I didn't realize that the G53 was machine coordinate. Oh, so you were assuming it'd go all the way back down <laughs> into the material. Yeah. I, I got you, okay. Yeah, that would be scary. <laughs> and they're done that one. Yeah. Why is your file <laughs> got a .nc extension? What's with the .nc? Okay, so it, it's they're all text files. It doesn't matter if it's a .txt or a .nc or .anything. Uh, it's just a text file. So your, your uh, controllers, your various controllers, depends on the software, uh, will default and look for either a text file or an nc file. And the Delta controller looks for a dot nc which stands for numeric control that's just the way they indicate so mach 3 uses text uh, which is just a you just open notepad you can open all of them in notepad because they're just text file it's just an extension that uh, delta is looking for now delta can open up text files as well but you have to tell it go look for a text file otherwise it'll it'll automatically look for an nc file okay well, you can, so you can it, change the extension, right, Trace? You can. Like I say, the extension means nothing. Um, it's because it is a text file. The standard for a text file is .txt. But for computers, especially high-end controllers like the Delta, they typically look for a .nc. So we had uh, Conversational Cam Pro generate its code as a .nc file. 
Hey, Tracy, what would you think of cutting that entire piece instead of just the arc? And the reason I say that is you're going to try to line up a piece that's square on your table. And to get uh -huh. it exact is a lot harder than just making the piece of wood a little larger. I don't have to take the piece of wood to my table saw or to my cutoff saw and get it to size first. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a uh, good suggestion. And it's perfectly legitimate. Let me go in here and show you one thing you want to uh, be aware of. And you've, you've got ways around this too. All right. So instead of just having this vector and cut this line, just cut this whole thing out of a piece that might be oversized. All right, so we cut the tenons first in a previous class. Therefore, I don't want to cut a, really around here, right? I would want the part to cut to length in order to cut the tenons. So if you were going to do that, which is perfectly legitimate, then don't have it cut this vector, you know, have it cut the entire, create a vector that does the whole thing with that arc. And it cuts it all out. And then you could put this in the vertical vise and cut the tenons afterwards, okay? But we cut the tenons first, so I had it already cut to length and width and, and we went and cut the tenons and now we'd clamp this up. The part that I have doesn't have the tenons on it because I just got a sample piece of MDF. Um, so I'm just assuming that maybe the tenons are in there, maybe they're not. But if they are, if you've done that first, then make sure you cut around the outside. But that's that's perfectly legitimate. So along that same line, what's the secret to getting it lined up so that it is parallel to the... Great question. All right, and that's what we're going to do next. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to load the program. I think I got a flash drive here. We're going to load the program. And then uh, we're going to set up the part and cut it so you can watch the whole thing. Now, in, in this particular setup, I did not I did not create any kind of table or clamping system, okay? So you have a lot of options. I'm going to use my vacuum table, not to hold the part down because the part's too small, but I'm going to hold a, the spoil board down with the vacuum table because it's not connected. But I, so I want to vacuum it down, and I'm going to attach the part to the spoil board with some double-sided tape. So the question is, how do we get it lined up and positioned exactly where we want it? Well, let's let's turn on the cameras and we'll we'll do we'll do that. Uh, let me save this uh, this G code first. Okay, so I'm going to save this G code. We'll save it onto the USB drive, and it's going to be the display table rail arch okay let me turn this other camera on real quickly and then we'll get set up Okay, so again, this is my vacuum table with the spoil board on. And then I've got these blanks. And they're already cut to 8.7 by 4 inches. They're 3 quarter inch thick. And again, we're just prototyping an MDF. I'll, I'm going to cut this table out of something nice, walnut or cherry or something, and then we'll build the table. But for right now, this is just for demonstration and for testing. So we're going to do this. Now, I took... I, will take a laser and I'm going to put it in the machine. And all I'm going to do is check. I'm going to check that that edge is, is lined up with the laser. And that's my Y axis will be set to zero. And then this front edge, I'll set to X zero. So the corner of that table is going to be my X zero, Y zero. And then I'm going to stick it down with double-sided tape, which I have right here, okay? So this is not a great production way to do it. It's a great way to test and just do sample parts. 
because I don't have to set up any kind of table, just use double-sided tape. That's what I'm gonna do here. And then of course we would set it up with a T-track with fences and everything else in order to establish you know, the real X, Y datum position. So I'm gonna put the, the laser in here and we'll just strike down that edge. And uh, you're not gonna be able to see the laser with these cameras because it's on the wood. It doesn't show up on camera unless I paint it black and then it shows up on the black. So you're just gonna have to take my word for it as I set it up you can see how it works. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the horizontal table. This is my work offset and my horizontal table. And my vacuum table is the first offset. Now you remember last time we had a catastrophe as we changed out of the work offset and back into turning, and it selected the wrong offset and we caught the jaws of the chuck with the cutter and destroyed everything. Well, not everything, but destroyed the bit, <laughs> okay? And that was my fault. And that's because I did not pay attention to my own rules, okay? So I'm gonna share my screen here with you real quickly. And you can go to our website and under training customer support files, there is a legacy CNC checklist, and the second one is the Delta checklist. Now, I have downloaded it, and so it's in my downloads, and then I opened it up, and we're going to cancel you. All right, and that's not the one I wanted. Sorry, let's close you out. All right, let's just go to my file explorer and open up my downloads. There's the Delta checklist. I downloaded it from our website. I'm going to open it with Adobe Acrobat. Okay. So if you were flying a plane, you'd never get in a plane and fly without going through the flight pre-check. And that's what I'm going to highly suggest here because had I just done that, I would have never crashed my, <laughs> my route a bit into the jaws of the chuck. Okay. We could have avoided that very simply. Uh, so I've been doing this for a long time. I still screwed up, okay? But if I had simply used this checklist, I could have, or we've already started with the system, home didn't warm the spindle, that's all done. So now we look through here and we say, okay, we're working on the horizontal table G code. All right, so first is select the horizontal table workstation, check. Now select a work offset, <laughs> okay? Which I did not do. I just went ahead and ran the program. But had I selected the work offset, and reached up here and selected it, I would have avoided that error, okay? Now, the work offset uh, had already been set, so I didn't have to worry about that, but I, I, that's an optional thing to set it. And I could have named it, which I did. That was taken care of, all right? And then says, set up the smart tool for multiple tools, either on the material surface or the bed surface. And we're gonna do it on the bed surface. And then ensure that smart tool is on, open the G code and start the program. So if I simply follow this, very, very simplistic checklist, I'll avoid the catastrophe that I had last time. So we have selected the work offset uh, table station in our Delta controller. We're using offset G54, which is the very first one called vacuum table. And I don't need to set it. Well, we might set it. I'm gonna check it right now and see if we need to set it. And I, I don't need to name, it's already been named. And then we're gonna do the smart tool. All right, so let's go ahead and stop sharing and take a look at it. All right, so what I'll do here is I'll simply tell it to pick up, I'm going to tell it to pick up tool number eight. Now this one has, this is auto tool change, so it has seven tools. So if I chose one through seven, it would pick it out of the tool clips. So I'm going to say pick up tool number eight. And so it's going to come up here to the front and I'll change it manually. Okay, so there it is. It's in there ready to go. Now what I can do is I'll go to my control and under go to, I'm gonna say go to the offset X zero, Y zero. Okay, and that should go right to the corner of the table. And this is where I'll check it. And if I need to, I'll align it. But the very first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the laser along the edge of the table just to make sure that edge is parallel. And then I'm gonna check the front edge 
and make sure that that's set to zero. So my X zero, Y zero will be set up perfectly to that table. Okay, so you can't see it in this in the photo here, but I'm actually splitting splitting the beam on the edge of that table. All right, so that is going to be my y zero. Make sure it's zero. It's already zero, but I went there anyway. Now I'm going to go back to my offset zero, and I'm just going to jog the y over a little bit this way, and I'm going to check the front edge, and it should be splitting the beam there. Now it's not splitting it, so I put it in step jog. And I just jog back until it splits the beam on the front edge. And then I'm gonna zero my X, okay? Now when I say go to the offset X zero, Y zero, it's right in the corner of that table and I know it's all set up ready to go, okay? Now the next thing I need to do is I need to set my smart tool. So again, if we if we looked at the checklist, okay, we selected the work offset and we set it. We went and checked it. I didn't have to name it, so it's done. So next, set up the smart tool for multiple tools. And if you'd always do multiple tools, you know it's, it's always going to work. In this case, we could do single tool because there's only one tool, but we will do multiple tools like the checklist suggests because I know it'll always work. And we're going to set it for the mesh, the bed surface, all right, not the material surface. Um, you take actually, the laser out, right, Tracy? Yes. Yeah, we definitely won't check off with the with the laser. That's for sure. Let me show you this one thing though. If I go in, well, let's go back into here. Um, okay. So if you're if you can't remember if you set the Z zero top the material or top the bed, you can simply come in here and look at your Z values, okay? And these values are all positive, which means with the exception of this one at 10 thousandths. And that means that all the values are above zero. So your Z zero is on the bottom of the part. Now, if all of the Z values were negative, then Z zero would be on top, and everything cut down in the material would all be negative. So we know just by looking at the Z axis values that we have to set the smart tool on the bed, not on the material. So I'll go do that first before we attach the blank. Let me see if I can focus that real quickly. Yeah, that's a little better. All right. What a good sharp oh. focus of that laser. <laughs> now I'll show you one other tool that I like to use. You can touch off with any any tool that you want. And in fact, we're gonna we're gonna pick up we're gonna pick up tool number two. So I'm gonna go to tool on my display screen and I'm gonna say pick up number two which is my quarter inch end mill. And then we'll hit the pick up. Take out the laser. Okay, it knew that eight was in there, so it had me take eight out. And now it's gonna go pick up two. Okay. Now I'll just tell it to go to the offset, X zero, Y zero. So it'll bring it up here to the front for me. And then I'll jog it whatever I need to get onto the smart tool pad. Now, I also need to make sure in control that my, uh, under control, I can look at my vacuum table. I have all four zones on and I have the vacuum table enabled. So I can turn it on and off by hitting that button. 
But whenever I'm doing a smart tool setup or running the program on a Delta system, it'll automatically turn the vacuum on if it's enabled, which we have it ready to go. So I just need to jog this into position and then do the multiple tools uh, touch off. Okay, so I'll, I'll go into smart tool and hit the multiple tool. As soon as I hit the button, it's going to start, you know, plunging. So make sure that it's on before you do that. And then we'll switch views. Okay, so if we go back and look at our checklist, all right, we're in the proper workstation. We've selected the proper work offset. It's still in the vacuum table offset. That's been set. We've done the multiple tool setup. Um, now, when I do multiple tools, it turns smart tool on for you automatically, but it says here, ensure so we just need to look at it and make sure and if i look on here on the screen sure enough it's on and so now we need to open the chico program and just start the program of course i have to attach my part first and then we'll run the program otherwise we'll be cutting in there all right so i'm just going to jog this back out of the way a little bit and i'm going to use a little double-sided tape this is the permacell tape that we have found works extremely well. And uh, you can use others, but I haven't found anything that works as good as this does. And yeah, I knew I had a knife here somewhere. Be careful, you might have to use a crowbar to get it off. <laughs> That's right. This tape is, is amazing, and the more pressure you put on it and the longer the pressure is on, the more it holds. And so one thing you don't want to do is cut something and leave it on overnight because you'll have to scrape it off, and it can tear the actual base table out, the spoil board material out. So we're going to take and just rip this tape off real quickly. We'll make the cut, and then we'll get it off. Okay. And you don't want to put too much tape on here. If I have a big piece, I really only put pieces in the corner and one in the center. If this was small enough, I'll just put a couple pieces, one at each end. And again, this isn't the best way to do production, but it's, it is a great way to do prototyping in just simple pieces because uh, you don't have to go to the trouble of changing the tables and setting up the uh, fence or anything like that. Okay, and you saw how I just set it on those two edges. All right, now we're going to um, we're going to open our program. Okay, and it's calling. I'm just looking at the the notes in the program, and as we expected, it's calling for tool number two, and that's the tool that's in here now. So it doesn't have to change tools. It'll just touch off smart tool. Smart tool is enabled, so it'll just run the program. It'll do it in two passes. Uh, we could have programmed it in more passes, but I figured this was probably enough. We'll keep our fingers crossed and, and hope the tape works.
Looks like you did that in a conventional cut. Okay, so you can see it after it turned off the spindle and everything, it moved it back to 12 and 12 so that I have access to the part to change it out and do another part, right? But it didn't climb cut. Well, which way did it cut? I didn't even know. It. Conventional. So it, it went it from the left to the right. Left to right. Started I think, on when you, I, I think when you were playing with the back and forth buttons, you left it on conventional the last time you saved it. Oh, uh, that's very possible. I'd have to go through and check it. So just to verify, it started here and cut that direction. Is that what it did? Okay. Yeah, that's that's definitely undercut. All right. And if we look here, let's see. If, oh, there you can see that edge in the center. And that's that, uh, that's that separate last pass. So the first cut moved out 15 thousandths and cut. And then the second one moved in. So it shows up on the waste part, but on our, on our uh, part that we cut out, it won't have that step. It's one solid cut along that full edge and it's done. Well. And so it doesn't have that, uh, that edge in the center, just a clean cut. Okay, now, real quickly, if I'm... Well. You can see that if I am cutting the tenons last, um, this works even though the arc is done because I'm using the build it clamps to secure it. And that straight edge is against the fence. And so when I flip it, to cut the opposite end or uh, of the, you know, with the tenon, it's working off that straight edge. So you could do it in any order. In fact, I kind of like the idea of cutting it out in the machine like was suggested, and then cutting the tenons last. That way you just have a blank that doesn't have to be cut to the exact size. But Tracy, didn't you offset the tenons and, uh, and stuff so that there's just a small reveal? So if you flip it like that, you're going to be off on one end? Okay, now I did not offset the tenons in the rail. I offset the tenons on the legs. And that moved the rail out to the front edge of, let me show you one of the legs. Offset the mort mortises. Correct. I offset the mortises. So here's the offset. This closer to this edge than it is to the back edge. So that that makes the the piece is going to move out to that front edge, right? Yeah, I, I because think, I thought you did it on both. No, the tannin I kept exactly the same. Exactly centered, so you could flip it and and friend. All right. Uh, usually, the uh, the critical dimension is shoulder to shoulder. So, uh, uh, in, in all the I, I cut these a million and six of these tenons on other machinery, and I would cut the first tenon, and it doesn't really matter how long the tenon is, but it, it is critical from shoulder to shoulder. So when I flip it over, I'd rather reference the shoulder that I just the of the first um, cut. So the second, so that shoulder to shoulder distance, that's your piece. The tenon could be a little bit longer and it doesn't matter, right? Right, so, you know, that's definitely an option and, and that'll work just fine. Now, I the way I did it was all to the numbers. So I cut it exactly the size I want and I set my Z, as you recall in the class, Z zero was set on the top here. So I controlled exactly how deep the mortise is, or excuse me, the tenon is on both ends, which, which left the shoulder to shoulder distance exactly the same. So I worked off the numbers and let the machine do the work rather than working off the stops and measurements. So your choice, which, whichever way you want to do it, they both work. Okay. It's, just a, it's just a quality check because, you know, best laid plans, right? <laughs> yeah, I know that all too well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any other questions on the, on the table so far or this process? 
All right, then let's take a second. There was a question before the class. <laughs> let me turn my let me turn my microphone on. Okay. Um, It'll be nice when I get the new cameras and the setup that I want, so I don't have to keep messing with this. You remember when we did the leg, uh, we talked about the decal set, and it has a the ring on the outside that will go on this, this metal ring, and then it has this inside one that goes on the handle, okay? And the question was about mounting it. And so let me just kind of go over this real quickly and ask, if you have a question, let me go ahead and answer it. Um, I think it was, I think it was, was it Bruce? Who was I talking to? Mark Emerson. <laughs> Mark. Yeah, Mark. Right. Okay. Mark. Mark took this and because it has the four holes, he actually positioned it onto the end of the bed and he drilled the holes and, and, uh, tapped them. And then he countersunk these holes so he wouldn't have the head of the screw. And so he actually screwed this in place and then it uh, attaches the, uh, um, the decal here to it afterwards, which is perfectly legit. Um, I didn't want to deal with the screws, and so I just took the decal here. And I stuck it onto the ring. And then I pulled this decal off, and I put it on the handle. And it's got a pointer on it that points straight away from the knob. Okay, there's two screws you can line it up with. So you just put that on there facing away from you. And it's very important that you level the bed. So you have to set both ends of the bed exactly to the same height. And the way that I do that is I take, typically take a, uh, a block. Now, I don't think I have anything here uh, to show you, but I, I take a block. It could be a I use an aluminum block, a one, two, three gauge block or a steel block, or you could use a wood block, but I put it on the rails and I set the Z on top of that block and I set it to zero. Then I move the block to the other end and I just bring the cutter down and I move this out of the way, move the Z to zero. And then I adjust the bed up and down until it's exactly the same height. So I know both ends of the bed are, are level. And at that point, I'll adjust the handle. There's two screws on it. And I will adjust the handle so that it is pointing directly away from me. That the knob is closest to me, the handle, the knobs point away. And then I will stick this down so that they'll line up. Zero, of course. So if you can see that, zero is going to go to the pointer when they line up like so. Now, when you order it, uh, if you do, if you already have double-sided tape, just use it. Or if you want to drill and mount like Mark did, that's great. Um, if you don't, you can get this double-sided tape, which we use all the time anyway, um, and use that. So a couple of options for you. Um, when I when I put the, the use the tape, what I do is I put the ring down over the the uh, handle, and I center it visually till I get it lined up the way I want it, and then I take a marker and I mark on the rail that it's sitting on the outside of the ring, <clears throat> and that way I know where to put the tape. I put it on those four corners inside the marks and then stick the part down to it, okay? So if you have any questions, of course, you can call in. We'll help walk you through it, but that's that's a simple process. I'll probably shoot a video and kind of show you how I did the whole thing to set it up, but I uh, wanted to, for those who already got your systems and um, you know anxious to get started, that's the way to do it. Okay, any other price? questions? Have you set a price that? on that kit? Is there a price on that kit yet? There is a price on the kit. Cindy has the price. Mark, do you remember what you paid for it? I I don't recall it off the top of my head. Uh, I okay. believe it was forty dollars. Okay. Forty dollars for the for the decals in the ring. And then if you he already had the tape, so if you want to order the tape, that would be separate. Tracy, I missed right? last week. What's the purpose of the ring? Oh, okay. Shipping was 16, by the way. Okay. Uh, for, oh, because it has to go out as a bigger box, right? All right. Let me, uh, let me share my screen real quickly. I want to see if I have.
It's for raising and lowering the P axis. Okay, can you see this on my screen? Yes. Okay, so this is the, of course, the hand wheel and the knob. And I put the one decal here, so it's pointing away. And then this decal on this ring goes below. So if you are looking straight down on it, uh, you know, you, it looks like this. You want these to line up. Well, I, I've got some parallax here, so it's not lined up. But I adjust the bed so it's level. And then I loosen the screws on the handle, which are actually underneath here, uh, under underneath the, the plate here. There's a screw on each side. I loosen those and I turn this handle till it's straight like this when the bed is level. And then I tighten it down. And then I go ahead and, uh, you know, set my other decals on here. Now, the, the reason that you do this is because when you are programming a tapered part, like in our display legs here, we had this turning around. Let me just finish that and I'm gonna, let me just look at the G code real quickly. So we'll generate the code just for that turning around. The first of it is setting the level and then it will say right here, adjust the bed, set the bed to 1.21 degrees. If you're using the Wixie digital angle gauge or something, you'd set it to 1.21 degrees. Um, if you're using the handle, it's 19.4 turns. Or if you're measuring the distance that it elevates, it's 1.94 inches. So the 19.4 turns makes it very, very simple to use because this is at zero, so what I do is I, I loosen the, the clamps down here at the bottom that lock the bed so it can't adjust. Once I have that done, I, you can see if I turn this counterclockwise, it'll lift the bed. <coughs> Excuse me. So I would turn this 19, and what was it, 19.4 19 point, 19 point turns. So I would rotate that 19, and then uh, once it came to zero, I'd go to one, two, three, four, and it'd be pointing right here. And the bed would be set exactly where I need it to cut my taper. Okay. So that's what this decal set is for, so that oh. you can easily adjust okay. the bed according to your taper work. If I have an artisan 72, would I still need this device? You have an artisan 72. Does it have, does the B axis? Uh, drive with a motor or is it have a handle that you crank it's solenoid operated control you don't by, need yeah, yeah you don't need this thing. that's actually got a b axis driver and it is controlled by the cnc so okay. your code if you were going to <clears throat> the conversational cam we go into the machine databases right now i'm looking at the gen 3 there's a field here that asks um the bed adjust, is it manual or is it automatic? Or if you don't have an adjustable bed, it's not, it's not applicable or not available. This one is manual. You would simply make yours so it said that it was automatic and it will generate the B axis code and control your B axis for you. Okay. Okay. So you're, okay. you don't have to worry about it. You're good to go. All right. Thank you. You bet. Tracy, All right. I Any other questions? Tracy, I use the crank handle, which are, works very fine. But if I want to check it with that measurement, that 1.94 in that case, where is that measurement I, taken from? The measurement is the elevation. And so I have seen customers that have put actually a, a scale on the, uh, the mechanism. So as they adjust the bed up, um, it, the pointer goes up the scale. And so they're, they're reading a dimension vertically off the scale. Um, it would, you would be almost impossible to try and measure that with a tape or something like that. So it's, I just put it in there for those who had, had gone to the trouble to set up a scale on their system. So Wixie oh. angle gauge, which is digital, or a scale if you put one on, or just use the crank, which is the easiest but way. But where on the, B, uh, where on the uh, bed is that 1.4 taken? Is that over the center of the handle or...? Um, yeah, center of the handle. So I don't know if I've got, I don't know if I have a view here that shows it. I don't know if you can see it here. All right. 
This one has a handle, and everybody's a little bit different, but this one has a handle, and it, it locks it down right there. And this slides up and adjust up and down this slot. So it's the amount of adjustment that that handle is going to move in that slot or how far the bed's going to, if you were to measure from this bed to the bed below, um, um, you know, the frame, then as you adjust it, it's going to adjust at that distance. And so it's how far this measures. Yeah, from the center of the handle, you're exactly right. But if you're measuring here instead of the center of the handle, you're only going to be off you know, a few thousandths of an inch, it would, it would be irrelevant. But it's really the center of the handle straight up. How how far does it raise that bed? Okay, the handles. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. That that should do it. All righty. Each tick of this, by the way, when it says 0.7, so if you turn it around to 0.7, from six to seven is 10 thousandths of an inch in that adjustment. They give you an idea of the accuracy. So it's it's by far the easiest way to get it extremely accurate. The, again, like we said last time, though, the one thing that is critical is there's a video on one of our classes that goes over these dimensions right here. It's called the pivot height, pivot lift height, pivot length start, and pivot length end. And those need to be correct. If they're not, you're not going to get the proper angle and your parts won't turn out the way you want. So you may want to review to that video and double check your numbers in your system to make sure it's correct. The one thing that we found last time we did the taper was that on my system, the pivot length start is actually behind the pivot point, the, the four jaw chucks behind it. So it's a negative number. And I was putting in a positive number. So my taper was off. But so you notice this one says negative 1.9. Um, and so that's one thing to be aware of. Just make sure that from the pivot point, your uh, wood is either going to be in front of it, which would be a positive, or behind it, which would be a negative. Tracy, do those four numbers also exist in the Mach 3 system in the machine coordinates? Or do they exist only in CCAM? They exist only in CCAM, okay? So CCAM is generating the code, uh, so it has to be in CCAM because as you adjust the bed on an angle, it sits on a taper, well, it moves the Z-axis, obviously, up, and it'll move the x-axis back, okay? As you set that angle, if you're pivoting here and you've got your bit here, it moves up and back. And so it has to do all the calculations so that you get the proper z measured off the smart tool and everything. And those calculations to generate the code in G-code is done from those numbers in, in uh, conversational cam. So it has nothing to do with mod or delta. Okay, any other Tracy, question? Tracy, is that video on the uh, website, the one for the pivot? Oh yeah, let me, uh, I keep jumping out just in time. <laughs> let me go back and I'll share show you. So if you go to training and to class review, okay? And as we found last time, it's, it's down a ways. They always, we put the latest class on the top. I need to organize these so that you can actually search for those to find them. But if we come down, we're going to find uh, the controller getting started. Let's recession. Um, I don't think it's back this far. Can you put in control F and just type in a keyword? I think um, you only needed to go down a little further. Yeah, it's down further, I think. Even farther than this? Straight there. Update CCAM turning around toolpath. I don't think it's that no, one. No. Going CCAM. down. There it right is. There. CCAM machine settings. Oh, That's it there. right there. Okay. And it's hard to read the PDF numbers, but if you if you download the CRV file and open it up, you can see the actual dimensions. So again, if I download this PDF, uh, it's hard to read the dimensions on here, even if I zoom in on it. But if you open it up as the uh, in Aspire or VCAR Pro, then you'll be able to read those numbers. Okay, but this will show you uh, how to. Um, you know, get those dimensions. Everything's measured off that pivot point, 
that's underneath the rail, either vertically or horizontally. Okay, any other questions? Got a quick question. I'm having a kind of a brain meltdown. What do you call a 2.5D model? It's not perspective or profile, but it's not a true 3D. It's called something else close to that. It's 2.5D or 2.5D model. That's, that's what they call it. Yeah, there's some name that they use all the time, and I can't remember what it is. It, it's not clip art, is it? Because no, uh, no, there's, there's a name for that them. kind of model. Where it's, you're only you're only kind of showing the face of it. And I forgot what it is. All right, I thought what am I doing? A, a rendering? No, no. A, a bas relief? No. I don't. I don't know what they would call it other than a two and a half D model. It's okay. the only thing I've ever known it as. But all right, thanks, guys. Bob, okay, any other questions? Like, that sounds like uh, your homework problem for next week. <laughs> Is that me or Tracy? <laughs> That was you. John, you better take that on. I, I know I won't have time. <laughs> I had the name earlier today, but it's an age thing. You know, I can't get it now. That'd be interesting to know. I'd, I'd like to hear it. If you find it, let me know. Percy, I have a question. You bet. Uh, is there anybody out there that's using SolidWorks to uh, a CAD program to run uh, the Mach 3 uh, controller? I don't know if there's anybody in this class, and if you are, please jump in. But uh, I use I, SolidWorks to model, and I can bring those models into Aspire. I don't know if that's. Do you do you export it as an STL out of the SolidWorks yes. to bring it in? Aspire? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty typical STL. I know SolidWorks can generate G code. But you obviously have to have the post processor and everything, so it generates the proper code. I have that uh, post processor. If anybody's interested, oh, for SolidWorks? Yes, I do. Oh, awesome! Sweet. Hey, if you if you would like, if you want to send me a copy, I'll post it on the website so anybody can download it if they want. If you if you don't mind, I don't want to assume anything, but I'll, I'll make that offer. You'll have it in about an hour. Great. Thank you. I'll look forward to it. Any other questions? Where are you going to put that uh, link at? Put the what? I'm sorry? The link to that uh, 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 for, for that file. Oh, so the, the link. link. Um, for the file updates for conversational cam, is that what you're referring to? Or for this project? Or for the one that this gentleman was talking about. Post-processor. Oh, the link for the solid, uh, uh, SolidWorks post-processor? Yes. It, it, yeah, um, it, well, he'll probably send it, he said it's you know, seen about an hour. So when, once I download the email, I'll just go ahead and post it. So probably tonight before I head home. He asked where. Oh, where? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, let me share my screen. I'll show you. Well, we always put everything in training. Come back. Come back. All right. Are going to be under tonight's uh, class or something like that? Uh, no, we won't put it in the class. I'll show you if I can enter it. You go to our website, go to training, and go to customer support files. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll list it in here. We have post processors for Vetric in here. Here's post processors for Vetric software. So I'll just make a category for the uh, SolidWorks post processor. Hey, Tracy. Yeah, Tracy. Was was that two and a half D? Is the word extrusion he was trying to? Slide. Two and a half D extrusion. John, is that what you were looking for? Yeah. 
No, oh, maybe Jones gone. Maybe he's gone. Yeah, okay. Yeah. By the way, I'm going to show you one of the classes we're going to do. You look behind me, you can see our Oneida dust control. I want to show you this. That is the swing arm, and it's hooked up to my dust manifold, which we don't have on the machine right now because you can't see it cut when I do that. But we can hook the dust manifold up, and now we have dust control so we can cut parts and not make a mess. So I want to do a class uh, on a swing arm like this. So if you would like to build one, I built this one for a six-inch diameter hose. I'm only using a five-inch diameter hose. And I build it so you can either feed the hose from the bottom, like you see here, or from the top, uh, either way. So um, I'll, I'll uh, post these plans as part of the class, and we'll do a class showing you how, if you want to modify it, do something different, and how we put it all together. So that's going to be a, one. And then I have another request for a class to do the threading process. So we're going we're gonna to create a class on cutting threads as well. So looking forward to both of those. All right, hey, well, Tracy, really quick yeah. on that dust collection. What do you do for your turning center? Do you, I mean, I mean when you're going up and down and what do you yeah. use for the dust shoe? There's no table. And so you're not going to get a hundred percent collection. You are going to have sawdust, especially larger chips fall, but it will collect all of the fine particulate and the dust and control it. So it's just going over the, the dust, um, or excuse me, it's going over the turning center. And it, it does work, but again, you will have larger chips and things fall as opposed to being sucked up. So it won't be 100% effective like it will on the table, but it, it'll certainly help a lot. Thank you for a wonderful class this week, Tracy. Yeah, thank okay, you. perfect then. I'll go ahead and end this off and uh, we'll pick up again next time. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll do the threading or if we'll do the, the swing arm, but uh, I'll let you know.